Sarah, are we live? Yes. All right. All right, we're going to get started, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the ninth annual Obesity Incubator Session, sponsored by the Brigham Research Institute's Cardiovascular Diabetes and Metabolic Disorders Research Center. I am Marie McDonald. I am the uh, chief of the diabetes section in the Division of Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Hypertension, and I'm joined here uh, with uh, by Mark Feinberg, uh, who is our, my co-chair, and we are just happy to welcome you today after this um, difficult year. And uh, but I'm still we're still calling this our annual session because really uh, last year was a little blip, and I, I'm proud to say that we're back. Uh, this has been one of our premier conferences over the years. Um, the goal, as always, of this session is to bring together Brigham and women, cl women clinicians and researchers working in the fields of obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, but also to bring our colleagues around us together to address this challenging public health crisis by promoting cross-collaborative research efforts and stimulating new ideas for further investigation. Today, we've already started the day with, this, with an outstanding poster session. We had 23 posters representing six institutions and 16, more than 16, departments and divisions. So congratulations to all of the poster um, submissions to, to those who submitted. Uh, we will be awarding three uh, posters um, today, so please don't, don't forget to um, attend our award ceremony along with uh, those who are giving us short talks today. Uh, if you couldn't visit all the posters you're hoping to, the presentation files will remain live on the website for a month. Contact info for the authors will also be listed if you want to connect, and the link is pasted in the chat right now. So the program for the event is also pasted in the chat in the form of a link. The plenary session uh, will start shortly. It will feature short talks by selected junior investigators in the field of obesity research, followed by a keynote presentation from Frank Scheer, uh, our colleague, uh, professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and director of the medical chronobiology program, uh, maybe uh, probably one of the first at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. Uh, we look forward to that talk as well. So now I would love to pass it off to my colleague and co-chair, Mark Feinberg, to introduce the first short talk. Thanks, Marie. So I'm Mark Feinberg. I'm uh, co-chair of our, our Brigham Research Institute CVDM Center, and I'd like to congratulate each of our presenters today. Uh, we now have three exciting short talks, and I'd like to remind everyone to please use the Q&A function to enter any questions, and Marie and I will do our best to get to those after the talks. Uh, so first up um, is Dr. Rajay Talbi. Dr. Talbi is a research fellow in medicine uh, at Brigham, and her talk is entitled Deciphering the Kiss Peptin Melanocortin Pathways Underlying the Regulation of Energy Expenditure. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, and, and take it away, uh, Rajay. Thank you very much. Do you see my screen? Can you hear me well? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you so much and uh, hi everyone. So today I'm gonna be talking about my postdoctoral project, which is for in which I am investigating the Kispeptin and melanocortin pathways that regulate energy expenditure. So reproduction is regulated by the HPG axis in which KIS1 neurons or GNRH neurons in the preoptic area control the production and release of LH and FSH from the pituitary to regulate gonads, secrete sex steroids, which later on will feed back on the brain and the pituitary. Kispeptin, as the name indicates, is a peptide heavily involved in the regulation of reproduction. Two populations of kispeptin neurons exist, a population in the AVPVPN, which integrates and regulates the LH surge and ovulation while we have a second population in the arcuate nucleus called the candy neurons, because besides expressing kispeptin, they also express neurokinin B and dynorphin A. This neural population is actually involved in the regulation of GnRH-LH pulses, therefore regulating fertility. 
Reproduction is tightly linked to metabolism, and the number of evidence are pointing towards the potential role of KISS-1 neurons in regulating metabolism. For the sake of time, I will not be going through all these evidence, but I think one of the most important findings was that KISS-1 neural cell bodies are heavily contacted by alpha MSH fibers. And when a mouse line with the congenital ablation of KISS-1 receptor was injected with a melanocortin receptor 4 agonist, LH levels were completely blended in this group as compared to all types, hypothesizing for the first time that actually KISS pectin signaling may be a major mediator for the excitatory effect of alpha MSH on LH secretion. So briefly, energy balance is regulated by the melanocortin system in which we have two main populations. Pompsy neurons uh, promote satiety through the action of alpha MSH on the melanocortin receptor 4. While on the other hand, NPY HRP neurons, they promote appetite through the action of GABA, NPY, or HRP, which also interestingly binds to the same MC4 receptor to antagonize the action of alpha MSH. It has been shown that deficiency in the melanocortin system are actually associated with severe metabolic disturbances. Mutations in leptin, leptin receptor, the POMC gene or the MC4 receptors have been associated with hyperphagia and severe obesity. And this has been the case for both humans and mice. And so actually in this project, I am investigating how KISS-1 neurons are involved in the regulation of metabolism. So in collaboration with Dr. Martin Kelly and Olin Ronick live in Portland, we first investigated whether POMC neurons directly contact KISS-1 neurons. We isolated in vitro KISS-1 neurons, we exposed those KISS-1 neurons to nanodrops of alpha MSH, and we found that this alpha MSH elicited an inward current or an excitatory action on KISS-1 neurons. Importantly, this has been found in the presence of TTX or citrodoxin, which is a polysynaptic transmission blocker, meaning that the action of alpha MSH on KISS-1 neurons is direct and excitatory. Also, using optogenetics, we injected a cream-dependent channel rhodopsin virus on a POMC cream mouse line to selectively stimulate POMC neurons that violate. And then the optogenetic stimulation of POMC neurons elicited this excitatory action on KISS-1 neurons. And importantly, this action was actually completely blunted when the melanocortin receptor 4 antagonist was added, meaning and hypothesizing that, hypothesizing that Alpha MSH released from POMC neurons activates MC4 receptors on KISS-1 neurons. However, at that time, we didn't really know whether KISS-1 neurons express melanocortin receptor 4. Th that's why using RNA scope, we did a clear assessment of the co-expression of KISS-1 neurons and MC4 receptors. We found that 84% of KISS-1 neurons in the ARC and 74% of KISS-1 neurons in the AVPV co-expressed MC4, which was really interesting to show that KISS-1 neurons may be really involved in the melanocortin circuitry uh, regulating metabolism. To investigate this, we um, generated a mouse model with a specific ablation of MC4 receptors from KISS-1 neurons. We validated that uh, in our KISS-1 MC4 knockout mice, KISS-1 neurons lack the expression of MC4 receptors while the MC4 are still expressed elsewhere in the brain, mainly the paraventricular hypothalamus, which is the main site of MC4 expression. We followed the body weights of these mice and found that the KISS-1 MC4 knockout males exhibit this increase in body weight, an increase in body weight that reaches significance as early as P80. This increase in body mass was also associated with an increase in fat mass and a decrease in lean mass. We also explored the liver fat in these mice using the old rat staining and actually found that this KISS-1 MC4 knockout mice, they have a significant increase in the liver fat deposition as compared to wild types, meaning that these mice are actually having serious metabolic disturbances uh, as compared to wild types and supporting um, that this obesity phenotype is actually very severe. So we subjected these mice to a high fat diet and this ex further exacerbated the body weight gain in these mice. And then we wanted to know whether this obesity phenotype 
is coming from impairments at the level of food intake or energy expenditure. And we found that while there was no really significant changes or impairments in food intake, these mice had decreased energy expenditure assessed by both a decrease in O2 consumption and CO2 production. Next, we explored the expression of UCP1 on the brain adipose tissue. And UCP1 is the protein that activates the thermogenesis of the brown adipose tissue, giving an idea of how the energy expenditure is regulated and whether it is increased or decreased. And we actually found that UCP1 levels were significantly decreased in the KISS1 MC4 knockout mice as compared to wild types, hypothesizing that KISS1 MC or KISS1 uh, neurons expressing MC4 may be regulating the brown adipose tissue thermogenesis. In order to further explore that, we activated KISS1 neurons and looked at the effect on the brown adipose tissue temperature. So I did that using chemogenetics or the DREADS technology in which I uh, injected excitatory DREADS coupled to m in the arcuate nucleus of kiss 3 head males. I implanted temperature transponders on the brown adipose tissue. And three weeks later, we activated KISS1 neurons using CNO, which is the DREADS agonist, and measured the brown adipose tissue temperature before and after activating KISS1 neurons. And we found that activation of KISS1 neurons in the arc actually activates and increases temperature of the brown adipose tissue, an increase that was reached as early as 15 minutes, therefore hypothesizing and supporting our hypothesis actually that KISS1 neurons may be regulating the brown adipose tissue uh, and so our hypothesis was that KISS1 neurons in the arc regulate the brown tissue. And this may be done through either of these brain nuclei that we know are involved in the regulation of energy balance. So I wanted to identify what are the metabolic centers that receive projections from KISS1 neurons. And I did that using the DREADS technology in which I uh, injected pre-dependent excitatory dreads within KISS1 neurons, and these excitatory dreads are coupled to synaptophysin and m cherry to label the neurons and their projections. Also, I activated KISS1 neurons and evaluated the CFOS expression in all these brain nuclei. And I also added KISS1 knockout mice group. And the reason I did that is to investigate whether the KISS1 action on these brain nuclei is KISPEPTIN dependent or independent because of what I mentioned earlier. KISS1 neurons in the arc, besides expressing kispectin, they also express neurokinin B, dynorphine, and glutamate. And so KISS1 knockout mice will have all the other components of the neuron intact, but not kispectin. So after validating my injections in the arcuate nucleus, we found that KISS1 neurons of the arc send heavy projections toward the dorsal medial hypothalamus, or DMH. This is a very important nuclei in terms of regulating the brown adipose tissue specifically and the energy expenditure in general. We also found that KISS1 neurons activate the brown adipose tissue, and this was assessed by CFOS expression within the DMH in the, dreads, uh, in the excitatory dreads uh, injected group as compared to the control group that was just uh, um, injected with um, an MC virus. Besides this, by looking at the brains of the KISS1 knockout mice, in which I also injected excitatory dreads in the arc, we also found KISS1 projections on the DMH. And we found that KISS1 neurons are actually also activated in DMH in these uh, mice, showing that KISS1 neurons projections to the DMH are not KISPEPTIN dependent. We wanted to investigate whether these projections can be glutamatergic, because we know that KISS1 neurons are glutamatergic, and the DMH uh, regulation towards the brown adipose tissue is also glutamatergic. Also in collaboration with Martin Kelly and Ulin in Portland, we injected a channel rhodopsin coupled to m cherry within the arcuate nucleus. Then we patched a cell from the dorsomedial hypothalamus around which KISS1 neurons terminals, here shown in red, were uh, present. And then we did the single cell uh, PCR of these patched neurons. And we found that these are lectin receptor expressing neurons. Then using the photostimulation of these neurons, we found that there was an excitatory action that was interested 
interestingly blocked when the glutamate receptor antagonists were added, showing that the action of kispeptin on DMH is glutamatergic. So finally, we show that his one neurons within the arcuate nucleus are parts of this melanocortin circuitry that regulates energy expenditure. We also show that KIS-1 neurons projections to the DMH are glutamatergic, and they are towards lectin receptor expressed in neurons. And currently, we are expressing this circuitry from the dorsal median hypothalamus to the brown adipose tissue in order to investigate what is the exact circuitry through which KIS-1 neurons regulate the energy expenditure. Finally, I thank everyone. I thank the Brigham for this opportunity to present my work, and I thank both the Navarro Lab and Kersner Lab and our collaborators. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rajay. A beautiful talk. Um, a lot of questions, I'm sure. Please do put questions in the chat. We have time for one or two. Uh, I'll kick it off. You, you showed initially that um, melanocortin receptor deficiency um, actually associated with hyperphagia or increased food intake, but yet your the KISS-1 um, um, knockouts were uh, or deficiency uh, use, utilizing the KISS-1 specific neurons did not show increased food intake. You, what other pathway might account for that discrepancy? So uh, to be honest, uh, so we still don't know. We found that the overall change in the overall food intake was not changing. However, we found that there is a slight impairment in the circadian rhythmicity of food intake. So these mice do not eat more but they actually consume more food during the, uh, the light phase as compared to the, to the nocturnal phase in which uh, mice are usually consuming their food. So we also know kiss one neurons project towards the paraventricular hypothalamus, which is the main site where the food intake is regulated. So they may be regulating uh, uh, food intake somehow, but in these mice, the main impairment was at the level of the energy expenditure. Great. I think Marie has a question. Go ahead, Marie. Yes, uh, Rajay, that was really beautiful, linking KISS-1 to brown adipose and, and basically energy regulation. It's really amazing. Um, I had a curious question about the, the, the mouse, the phenotype of your KISS-1 MC4R um, knockout. Did those, when you fed them a high-fat diet, did they develop diabetes or were they able to expand their fat mass enough to avoid diabetes by improving glucose disposal. I was just curious about that. So uh, to be honest, we didn't go, we didn't explore that. I subjected those mice to a glucose tolerance test and they didn't have any impairments. Right. So they had as normal glucose levels as the wild type mice. That may be because, mainly because glucose uh, uh, homeostasis is regulated at the level of the lateral hypothalamus. And the main action, here is at the level of the arcuate nucleus and the preoptic area. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the reason why the glucose levels of my mice were was completely normal. Interesting. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks so much. We're going to try to keep on, on schedule on time. So thank you, Rajay. Um, our next uh, speaker is Dr. Selma uh, Bulunauer. Uh, Dr. Bulunauer is an instructor in neurology at, at the Brigham, and Dr. Bulunauer will present on high fat diet causes rapid loss of intestinal group three innate lymphoid cells through microbiota driven inflammation. Thank you, uh, Selma. The, uh, Thank you. Or yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm humbled by this beautiful invitation. And without further ado, I'm going to perhaps uh, talk about an old, pro sorry, an old problem that was uh, studied from Hippocrates already point of view, suspecting that all disease begin in the gut, and that our food should be our medicine and our medicine should be our food. So this is a, when we talk about food, of course, we talk about overweight and this is becoming our lifetime obsession. A uh, big part of it because okay, we are under COVID pandemic, but obesity has been now emerging as a, as a pandemic associated to many disease. Um, and uh, of course, it becomes obvious that overweight to obesity is, is leaning towards an unhealthy uh, situation. However, it's not always clear. Uh, people, uh, increasing data have shown that especially contributions from metabolism and cardiovascular uh, disease, um, exper experts show that 
that there is an obesity paradox where we still have um, obese, healthy, uh, healthy obese as opposed to unhealthy uh, lean. And uh, the situation of the gut in this particular case is, is really unknown. We don't know much about the, how healthy is the gut in, in, these, uh, in these situations. And uh, however, there were lots of uh, data uh, coming up from the, micro, the study of the microbiome. And uh, we know that the, the microbiota is, is a gamer uh, of uh, multiple uh, disease now, uh, including diabetes, insulin resistance, resistance, obesity, and the microbiota is influenced by a series of, uh, of uh, factors, including the lifestyle, the, the, the food, the, the, the immune composition. But we still don't know really what are the immune checkpoints that are um, uh, really triggering uh, uh, gut problems, gut homeostasis, and uh, which, which we would be considered at the earliest time points of, uh, of uh, metabolic disease in this instance that has been related to endotoxemia. So that was uh, my, my question. And uh, it turns out that the, one of the key players of gut homeostasis uh, are ILCs, so innate lymphoid cells. I'm particularly interested on uh, group three ILCs uh, that are actually um, uh, very abundant. They are part of the innate immune system. They are very abundant in, in the gut. And uh, not only they promote uh, tolerance towards the microbiome by expanding Tregs, uh, but also they, they, they are able to, to drive non-immune fu functions such as gut repair uh, by uh, in a response to some uh, tissue damage or um, uh, invasive pathogens by promoting the uh, uh, the reparation through the, re the release of IL-22, they are considered to be the major source of IL-22 uh, that promotes tissue regeneration um, and division. These ILCs respond directly to uh, all sorts of uh, stimuli within the gut microenvironment, stimuli coming from other immune cells, non-immune cells, but also directly from dietary metabolites or uh, microbial metabolites. And uh, when it comes to the fat, how these cells respond to the fat, it becomes very difficult to study them because every time we, we try to study the immune system and fat, we are confronted to the, uh, to the artifact of obesity obesity and all what it includes. So, and this is really uh, a big gap in knowledge because um, lo despite lots of efforts uh, on, on gut immunology, uh, we still don't know what are the, 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 the parameters. Is it is the defect that we see in the gut immune system due to the obesity, to insulin resistance, to glucose, to the microbiota, to specific dietary fat, to the adiposity, to, and all, whether all of that matters really in human, is it something that we see in, in vivo in mice? And thanks to the collaboration I had with Dr. Scott Snapper in gastroenterology here at the Brigham, we found for the first time that actually ILC3s are severely depleted in uh, uh, proportionally to the BMI of, uh, of healthy uh, humans, healthy patients, uh, at least from the, they don't have IBD problems or uh, other known bowel uh, problems, uh, except that the ILC3s are severely uh, depleted. And we see that in the same situation in, in, in mice, uh, DIO mice, diet-induced obesity mice. What is striking is that this, these ILC3s come in two subsets and one of them is really fetally derived. And uh, it's hard to deplete these ILC3s. We do that usually by irradiation, although we, uh, we never have complete depletion as we see here with a high fat diet, which was quite spectacular. And I checked that it's not that this ILC turn into with fate might, uh, fate, fate map mice, they don't turn into other ILC. ILCs or other cells because they really disappear. The, their uh, loss is rather localized in the small and large intestine. We don't see them uh, lost in other peripheral uh, lymphoid uh, tissues such as the MLN. And this is not an artifact of the digestion of the tissue because I confirmed it with Confocal where you see this red ILCs disappear. 
in a, in a very striking way, I asked the question whether OBUB mice who are overweight, the DIO mice, have the same problem. And actually, OBUB mice have similar uh, level of ILCs as lean uh, uh, mice. However, as soon as we give them high fat diet, they have this dramatic loss of ILC3s. And I asked the question whether it's an overfeeding problem. Uh, so I conducted uh, paired fed uh, uh, studies where the mice do not gain weight uh, because uh, they, they feed the same amount of calories in fat uh, compared to at lipidum controlled fat uh, controlled diet mice, and indeed they uh, it, it, they are still lean, but they are fed high fat diet, and they have a severe loss of ILC threes. So what happens if we prevent the absorption uh, of, of the fat in, in mice uh, eating high fat diet at libidum? I used Orlistat, and incredibly, I was able to prevent this ILC three loss. And I asked the question whether a specific fat would lead to uh, the loss of these ILCs. So I tried different dietary fats ranging from their origin vegetarian versus animal fat or uh, having different uh, length of their carbon chain or the saturation level, what would be the major fatty acid and of course saturation in, in cholesterol. And without uh, going into too much details, all mice eating this dietary fats gain weight to the same extent. However, mice fed uh, fish do not lose their ILC3s. And this is associated to the level of endotoxemia in their blood, where actually uh, they don't have much uh, low-grade endotoxemia when they are fish, and their uh, inflammatory status in the terminal ileum is, is really high with all sorts of fat except, except fish. And we know that this uh, is, when we talk about endotoxemia, we include the microbiome. So I was wondering whether the phenotype of the ILC3 loss is related to the microbiota. So I fed germ-free mice high fat diet and incredibly they are not resistant to put on weight but rather um, increase their adiposity as shown here with MRI, uh, both expansion of visceral and subcutaneous fat. And they put on weight of course. And uh, unlike the conventional mice fed home, uh, high fat diet, germ-free mice have absolutely intact ILC3 levels in their gut. And what happened is that when I inoculate these germ-free mice with either uh, heat killed bacteria from any uh, SPF mice, uh, fed control diet, high fat diet, or even if I inoculate them with LPS, actually I can trigger the loss of these ILC3s. And of course, this is accompanied to a high level of endotoxemia only when mice are fed high fat diet in combination with this microbial compounds. And of course, the inflammation is incredibly high uh, in, the, in the gut as opposed to controlled uh, diet fed mice inoculated with bacteria. So how early this could happen, we know that the microbiota change rapidly as, as early as a week after high fat diet. And we looked at that. We looked at 20, as early as 24 hours, and we found that we detect already endotoxemia in, in these mice fed uh, high fat diet. I mean, SPF mice fed high fat diet as early as 24 hours, which increases over time. Interestingly, we don't, we don't detect any changes in glucose intolerance at this stage. So, so suggesting that this gut permeability is happening before, uh, before we, we are able to detect any problems in, in glucose levels. And when we checked, indeed, the ILC3 starts to decrease uh, already uh, uh, in the first week. And like the first part of our studies where we were been looking at weeks, if not months. So that was quite spectacular to appreciate this dramatic and rapid loss. And it's happening through uh, cell death as witnessed by this annexin uh, 5 staining. When we sorted the, the, the cells, ILC3s, at the very first 24 hours, we found that they are bona fide uh, ILC3s. They have uh, an overactivation status by their ability to produce a huge amount of cytokines. However, they start to get exhausted and they respond to a lot of inflammatory cytokines, such as uh, TNF alpha, which uh, caused them to have activated uh, NFKPB and uh, defect in their UPR and ER responses. So 
we confirmed the same uh, thing in uh, germ-free inoculated with LPS or not. And we see that this germ-free really inoculated with LPS behave uh, like SPF mice fed high fat diet um, uh, in, in the way they, they trigger all sorts of uh, apoptosis and uh, cell death pathways in their ILCs. We recapitulated this phenotype in vitro where ILCs isolated from high fat diet germ-free mice. Uh, they are able to produce IL-22 when mutated at steady state level of, of uh, cytokines. However, in increased level of TNF alpha, which mimics the inflammatory milieu, they start to die as um, uh, shown by this LDH, lactate dehydrogenase cytotoxicity assay. And then when we block the inflammation in vivo by giving anti-TNF alpha or a pan, um, a pan anti-inflammatory drug such as N-acetylcysteine, uh, we're able also to rescue this ILC3 loss. And uh, finally, even mice who've been under high fat diet for a long time and becomes obese and severely depleted with ILC3s, as long as we reverse them to control diet, um, um, we are able actually to, um, uh, to rescue the ILC3s. And this is a gra graphical abstract uh, summarizing what I'm trying to say, that germ-free eating high fat diet, so there is no inflammation coming from the microbiome. The ILC3s are healthy and able to uh, have homeostasis in the gut. However, as soon as the gut is exposed to dysbiosis, to microbial compounds, this triggers inflammation and ultimately the cell death of ILC3s. That happens as early as 24 hours. And this situation is luckily uh, reversible through different strategies, either by blocking the inflammation or the fat diet intake, or even uh, regenerating the cells uh, after reverting to uh, a regular diet. And uh, I would like to thank my mentor, Dr. Howard Weiner, for his support and trust and letting me lead this project independently with my students, Eva and Pauline. Uh, I couldn't have done it without uh, uh, great collaborators. And of course, I would like to thank Lydia Lynch, who's been an incredible role model to introduce me to this, uh, to this field. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Beautiful talk. Um, a lot, very provocative and, and um, uh, impact in, in terms of our nutrition. Um, there's a, a few questions. We have time for a couple. Um, is there anything unique in fish diet uh, related to omega-3, omega-6 that may um, account for the protective um, impact on IL-3C uh, IL uh, cells? Yes, so uh, fish diet is having uh, indeed, uh, as you mentioned, uh, this omega threes and omega six that are natural anti inflammatory. Uh, um, factors. So uh, we believe that uh, there were lots of studies that uh, showed that the fish fed mice uh, do not have problems with the gut integrity and gut permeability. So basically, there are lots of factors promoting the, uh, uh, the junctions in the epithelium, which prevents the leak of the bacteria inside uh, the, the lamina propria of the gut where the ILC3 resides. And, uh, and therefore, these ILC3s, despite their uptake of the, of the fat, they would not have to, to face the, the microbial-driven uh, inflammation uh, that caused them to die. Great. And, and these are ROR gamma T defined cells. Um, these uh, ILC threes, uh, is IL-17 figure prominently in this pathway? Um, so I, you mean IL-17 coming from these ILC threes yes. or coming from the T cells? Uh, both. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I did not look at the expression of IL-17 in the, in the ILC3s, uh, simply because they die rapidly. And uh, we've been really looking at the IL-22 as the major drive of, um, uh, of uh, gut integrity, gut repair. However, um, the T-cells, there are other data and other uh, 
uh, unpublished data actually that showing that the, there is an increased uh, production of IL-17 by T cells in uh, in gut of mice fed high fat diet. So uh, which is really very much supporting the idea of uh, increased gut intestinal inflammation and susceptibility to bowel disease as well because of this uh, IL-17 increase. Okay, so uh, the, okay. the T cells are able to increase their production of IL-17, but they are somehow uh, less uh, susceptible to this dramatic uh, cell death as opposed to an innate cell uh, who has other intracellular, perhaps this is another area that I would like to follow, uh, different way of immunome immunometabolic pathways to incorporate both signals from inflammation and dietary fat. Okay, one, one quick question um, in the Q&A, uh, does the composition of the microbiome impact inflammation here? So as long as the microbiome leaks into the, the gut, I've shown that it's not really specific to a, a specific type of microbiome because heat killed bacteria, heat killed bacteria from even a healthy mouse is sufficient to, um, to support the same inflammation. So for me, it's not really bacteria specific or um, uh, cytokine, inflammatory cytokine specific, but it's, it's really the overall um, um, inflammatory microenvironment that is created uh, in the gut, especially leaking uh, gut permeability uh, is the problem here. Great. Well, thank you so much. We're going to uh, proceed with our third speaker, very uh, provocative talk. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to turn it back over to Marie for, to introduce our third speaker. Great job, Selma. And uh, thanks, Mark. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our last final talk speaker, uh, Danielle Haslam. Danielle, uh, she is, um, Dr. Haslam is a research fellow in medicine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. She will present on discovery and validation of a saliva metabolic signature of insulin resistance and diabetes progression among Puerto Rican adults. And just a reminder to use the Q&A function to ask her questions at the end. Danielle, take it away. All right, thank you so much for the introduction. And thank you for the opportunity to present our work here today. We're gonna to be switching gears a little bit and looking at an epidemiological approach that we applied here to try to identify a saliva metabolomic signature of insulin resistance. So just some background here on why we decided to do this study. So undiagnosed type two diabetes is common in minority populations, especially compared to white populations. You can see in this study here, that it was conducted in 1999 to 2011. You can see the increasing percentage of um, participants that were found to have undiagnosed diabetes among the non-Hispanic Black and Mexican Americans compared to only around 2% that were um, undiagnosed in white populations. And in particular, Puerto Ricans have established health disparities compared to even other Hispanic groups as well as compared to white populations. So they have higher rates of type two diabetes, higher hospitalization rates. They also have, tend to have uh, poor cardiometabolic health in general. And there's really not a, oh, it's not well understood the molecular pathways that contribute to this increased risk in Puerto Ricans. So here we decided to look at saliva, which is a non-invasive alternative that might be particularly useful in minority populations for diagnosis and screening of type 2 diabetes. So here we first aim to identify a saliva metabolomic signature of insulin resistance using HOMA-IR as the main outcome. And we also looked at how this metabolomic signature that we identified was associated with type 2 diabetes progression in Puerto Rican adults. Here's a little bit about the study that we used here. So we had the San Juan adult longitude, overweight adult longitudinal study. So these participants were recruited when they were free of type two diabetes, but they were overweight or obese around 40 to 65 years of age. And we recruited about 1200 participants and have followed them for three years so far. And the main aim of this study is to identify the bi-directional association between periodontal disease and type two diabetes there's this interesting relationship between the two. 
And th that's actually why we have the saliva samples in this population. So these individuals are well phenotyped. We have interviews that were collected things like demographics, medical history, health behaviors, medication use, as well as anthropometrics and other um, cardiometabolic risk factors. And these include uh, fasting blood and fasting saliva samples. So let's dive into how we identified the saliva metabolomic signature of insulin resistance. So we used the baseline samples of saliva and we measured the unnamed and named metabolites in the saliva using the Metabolon platform. And we excluded the metabolites that were that had high missingness and found about 600 metabolites that we were able to identify. And I'll, I'll go in deeper into which metabolites we, we were able to measure. And also we took the missing values and we were able to impute these values based on the half the minimum, which is a typical um, procedure that we use in metabolomics analysis. And we also inverse normal transformed the metabolites because many of these distributions are skewed and we, for the elastic net regression, we'd like to have the normal distribution. So here's how we identified the signature using the elastic net regression, which is a machine learning technique. So essentially it takes the 600 metabolites that we measured and it tries to find the metabolites that are most important for prediction of the outcome of choice, which we were using HOMA IR here. We first examined a training set of individuals, about 500 individuals, then, and we used the tenfold cross-validation here to identify the set of metabolomics, metabolites in the signature. And then we applied this signature to the testing set of 300 individuals to see whether we were able to validate it in a separate population. And finally, we were able to calculate a metabolomic score for each participant. So using the metabol metabolites identified from the elastic net regression, we gave each individual a score based on the, their metabolite levels. So once we had the score for each of the participants, we were able to run Cox proportional hazards models to look at diabetes progression. And we also adjusted for several potential confounders listed here. So you can see many of the typical confounders we're adjusting for smoking, physical activity, education and income, age and sex. And we also have some medication use, family history, and additionally um, adiposity measures. So let's look a little bit about diabetes progression in this population. So you can see here that at baseline, we used fasting plasma glucose, two hour plasma glucose after the uh, oral glucose tolerance test and HbA1c to identify individuals that had type two diabetes, prediabetes or, or normal glycemic. So at baseline, there were 383 participants with normal glycemia and 481 participants with prediabetes. And then during the follow-up, we actually found 54 new cases of type two diabetes. And you can see there were also 135 new cases of prediabetes here. And in addition to this, we also looked at individuals that moved from prediabetes to normal glycemia. So we did have 123 participants that improved their um, insulin sensitivity. Here's a little bit more about the population. So individuals at baseline that had prediabetes tend to be slightly older, have a higher BMI, higher waist circumference, less likely to smoke, and also more likely to be on lipid lowering medications as we would expect. So here's the signature that we were able to identify. There were 98 metabolites in saliva that were identified in this signature. And the signature correlated with HOMA IR at 0.39, which is moderate correlation, but this is um, pretty typical for the elastic net regression models. This is actually a pretty um, strong correlation. And you can see the distribution of the metabolites across the super pathways here. Many of them were amino acids, and many were also lipids, but we had a distribution across many different super pathways. And I also pulled out the top metabolites here with the highest weights. And you can see in the green, these ones were positively weighted and the, the red, they were negatively weighted. And some of these overlap with 
other metabolites that have been associated with type two diabetes and plasma as well. So urate is one of them. And there's also several aromatic amino acids and uric acid um, metabolites that are re related to type two diabetes and plasma in previous studies. Okay, so now we'll go back to the progression throughout the, throughout the study to prediabetes or type two diabetes and show some results. So when we looked at participants that were either normal glycemic or pre-diabetic at baseline, they had a 1.77 higher risk of moving to type two diabetes with each one standard deviation and higher um, HOMA IR saliva metabolomic signature. So we were able to see uh, that this, this signature that we identified is associated with type two diabetes risk. And as well, we saw that among the individuals that had normal glycemia at baseline, there was also 1.6 times the risk to move to prediabetes with a, with a one standard deviation higher um, home IR signature. And when we looked at prediabetics to type two diabetes, the association was still in the right direction, but it was not significant here. And then finally, when we looked at participants with prediabetes that moved to normal glycemia, we saw actually a lower risk. So that would mean that individuals that had a higher saliva metabolomic signature of insulin resistance were less likely to move back to normal glycemia in the follow-up. So in conclusion, in these individuals living in Puerto Rico, we were able to identify a saliva metabolomic signature that predicted both development of prediabetes and type two diabetes in the three year follow-up. And from here, we'd like to explore this a little bit more, trying to compare the ability to predict diabetes progression from the saliva metabolomic signature to the ability to predict it with the current risk factors that we have. We'd also like to integrate plasma metabolomics profiling to identify a multi-fluid metabolomic signature of insulin resistance. And then finally, we wanna look deeper into how these metabolites relate to one another and identify altered pathways so we could try to understand the mechanisms by which the saliva metabolites might be altered in these individuals at higher risk for type 2 diabetes. So then I'd like to thank all of our collaborators, uh, my main mentor, Dr. Shilpa Bhutharaju, and all of my other collaborators at Brigham, um, the Harvard School of Public Health and the Nutrition Department, also the University of Puerto Rico, where they were able to conduct this study, and then the Broad and UCLA. So thank you for your attention. That was terrific, Danielle. Congratulations on this work. Um, I'll just start, and please, uh, folks, um, if you'd like to set, put a question in the uh, Q&A, that'd be great. Um, so Danielle, I, I saw that the, um, the strength of the relationship between the metabolome, the, 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 the metabolites that you found and progression to diabetes was weak, weaker in the prediabetes patient. And that's probably because prediabetes alone is, is just a stronger predictor. And so the, the question is, um, do you see this um, tool as really like a pre-prediabetes identifier, identifying patients who are um, so early in the pathophysiology that you could, um, I, I think, you know, it's basically earlier in, in terms of um, the opportunity to prevent diabetes. Yes. Yeah, so that's actually, we were, we were a little bit surprised that we weren't able to see a stronger relationship between um, the prediabetes to diabetes. But I, I think what you said is that their, their metabolism is already altered. And that's probably why we're not seeing the, the change as much. But I think that it's really interesting that we're able to see the higher risk in individuals that are actually have normal glycemia. So these participants, you wouldn't, you may not think of them as being at a high risk of going on to develop type two diabetes, but they actually are. Um, we're able to see that these participants may go on to develop prediabetes, which, and, and then from there, they might go on to develop diabetes. Yeah. So it's, right. And we don't have uh, standard measurements for the pre pre diabetes yeah. state. Um, and we stop at prediabetes usually, right? Yes or no. So mm -hmm. that's pretty powerful. Good for you. Um, uh, any other questions for Danielle? All right. Well, we are moments away from our keynote speaker. 
And I just want to first uh, just congratulate the short talk of speakers. They will all receive an award. Uh, and just a reminder before we move on to our keynote speaker that we will have an award ceremony following our keynote. Uh, and on that, on that note, before we start, I would like to recommend everybody just standing up since we've been sitting and we know that sitting increases your, for more than an hour, increases your uh, inflammatory markers that promote cardiovascular disease. So I'm going to stand up and then before we and walk around, shake a little bit. This is good for you. Uh, thank you. I see a little dancing there. I like that. Okay, terrific. All right, so this is, uh, it is a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Frank Scheer. Uh, Dr. Scheer is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is the director of the medical chronobiology program at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Shear's work focuses on influences of the endogenous circadian system and its disruption, such as with shift work. And he's really made major contributions to our understanding of that disruption on cardiovascular disease, pulmonary um, pathways, metabolic regulation, and other disease states, including diabetes and obesity. Since 2005, Dr. Shear has been continuously funded as a PI for, by the National Institute of Health he has received numerous scientific awards, He's including the Young Investigator Award by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, the Neil Miller Award by the Academy of Behavioral Medicine Research, and the Outstanding Scientific Achievement Award by the Sleep Research Society. Dr. Shear is an editorial board member of several peer-reviewed journals. He's an associate editor of the journal Sleep and is a member of the board of directors of the Sleep Research Society. He importantly co-founded and currently directs the MCP, which is an interdisciplinary research program at BWH to foster the translational research in sleep and circadian biology to understand uh, the basis behind time variant changes and disease severity. And certainly has helped us understand that as it relates to metabolism um, and, and uh, specifically interaction with genetics as well. Understanding the biological basis of these changes across day and night um, and the interaction with genetics, we're all, we all are eager to hear more about that. Um, it, as we know, it may help in the development of personalized and time-based behavioral, um, environmental, and pharmaceutical interventions. So without further ado, I'm just going to turn it over to Dr. Shear as he gives us a, a lecture on circadian, cir circadian system effects on obesity. And metabolism. And we welcome you, Frank. We're so happy to see you. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much, uh, Marie, for that very kind uh, introduction. And thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me to uh, give this lecture. I'm really honored and delighted to present the keynote. Uh, so let me just share now my slides. Uh, I hope you can see my slides okay. Yeah, you're good. Excellent. Um, so I will be talking about three uh, points here in this, um, in this presentation. First, I will be talking about the circadian system and examples of its importance. I'll be talking about circadian misalignment as occurs in shift work. And then I'll be um, talking about the effects of melatonin dependent on uh, a person's genotype. So let's first uh, give a brief introduction into the circadian system. What do we actually mean uh, with that? So I'm gonna take you back in time, some uh, three and a half billion years uh, since uh, the beginning of life, it's been exposed to the light dark cycle, of course, because of the rotation of the earth around its axis. And life on earth has, has um, adapted to this, as, it, as is uh, shown here by this heliotrope plant opening its leaves during the day, closing them at night. And uh, if we now move forward in time, just 300 years ago, to an experiment done by Jean-Jacques Trudeau de Meran, a French astrophysicist, who asked a very simple but insightful question, which was, why is this leaf opening and closing its leaves? Is this purely due to the exposure to the light dark cycle or is it something else? Is it something intrinsic to the plant? 
And so what he did is he stopped the rotation of the earth, at least from the point of view of the plant, by placing the plants in uh, dim light conditions, con constant dim light conditions, and found, as we see here as well, that the leaf movement continued. And so subsequently, it's been shown it's not due to temperature oscillations or other aspects, radi other radiation factors. And so this was really the first uh, published report on evidence for the existence of circadian rhythms, with other words, intrinsically generated biological rhythms that are persistent even in the absence of external time cues. So how is this uh, 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 possible? How, what is actually driving this rhythm? And so it was only um, in the beginning of the 70s that uh, a breakthrough was achieved when looking at the site of the biological clock. And this, the hunt was on in the mammalian system and the approach was uh, lesions in the brain because it was assumed well in the mammalian system, this is probably residing uh, somewhere in the brain. And so indeed, uh, when they lesioned one particular tiny uh, structure, the suprachiasmatic nucleus uh, in the hypothalamus, they found that if you take that nucleus out, the animal becomes arrhythmic. So it was shown that this um, suprachiasmatic nucleus is necessary for circadian rhythm generation. But it wasn't sufficient to actually uh, prove that this was the clock because it could just be downstream of the actual clock. And maybe these animals were just not able to express the uh, circadian rhythm. So the other piece of evidence was, and this is a very nice uh, uh, video if it works and it does, uh, showing that even the SCN by itself without the rest of the brain, if you uh, put it in a Petri dish, it happily uh, oscillates. And this is per look um, expression. So uh, a core clock gene linked to luciferase. And you can see this sped up um, uh, video showing these 24 hour oscillations. So it is a structure that is both, both necessary and sufficient for circadian rhythm generation. And so for the next uh, 20 years or so, the model was that we have one uh, master clock that regulates all our circadian rhythms. But then um, some 20 or 25 years ago or so, it was actually discovered that if you put a fibroblast in a Petri dish or a liver cell, a heart cell, a fat cell in a Petri dish, it uh, itself can generate similar 24 hour rhythms. So it is not a feature that is unique to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It is something that is intrinsic. This uh, cell autonomous uh, clockwork is intrinsic to uh, virtually every type of uh, cell uh, in the body. And so very quickly, it changed from a rather uh, simple system with one clock to a tremendously complex multi-oscillator system. Uh, composed possibly of trillions of clocks, if indeed every cell in the body or virtually every cell in the body has a clock. So now the next question was, okay, well, what is actually enabling this single cell to generate a clock? Also, SCN cells, suprachiasmatic nucleus cells themselves have been shown to be uh, rhythmic. So it wasn't a neural network property, this rhythm. So it was something that needs to be contained within a cell. So how is this possible? And this was actually the basis for the 2017 Nobel Prize in uh, Physiology or Medicine, where it was shown by these uh, three pioneers, uh, Jeffrey Hall, Mike Rosbash, and Mike Young, that uh, there is a, a transcription, translation feedback loop, uh, which whereby the product, uh, so for example, uh, PERS of the cries, feedback negatively and inhibit their own production. And so this oscillation takes uh, 24 hours approximately, such that a cell by itself is able to generate an, uh, a circadian rhythm and keep time. But just timekeeping is not sufficient because that's like having a, a clock without uh, hands. And so, so what is the relevance of this? And of course, first of all, you need to control something. And indeed there are uh, clock control genes that are regulated by this uh, core clock machinery that then enable the core clock to 
influence the physiology and functioning of the cell. Uh, and what is the purpose then of the circadian system? Uh, one of which is to uh, keep the circadian system in sync with the external uh, environment and the primary side gate or time cue for that is light. And so it's enabling the circadian system to synchronize uh, with the day-night cycle. And the purpose or one of the benefits of that would be to not just respond to changes in the environment, to, but to actually predict, to tell the future and anticipate the uh, needed uh, changes, such as anticipations in order to cope with uh, increases in radiation, UV radiation during the day, or the drop in, in environmental temperature during the night. But also uh, another function is actually to synchronize all these different physiological functions within the body uh, intrinsically. And the way to, one way to think about this is that you actually want to uh, compartmentalize uh, in time uh, activities that are internally conflicting. So you don't want to have uh, at the same time catabolism and anabolism happening, or you don't want to have some in intermediate state between sleep and wake. And so what's the relevance then? Well, first of all, uh, one, when one thinks about the circadian system, many people think about sleep. And indeed, sleep is importantly regulated by the circadian system together with homeostatic sleep uh, regulation. But virtually every aspect of physiology and behavior is influenced by the circadian system uh, to some degree. And so this has been established by a multitude of uh, studies, but more recently, uh, with this knowledge about circadian regulation of physiology uh, and behavior, there's been an increasing interest into the consequences and the relevance for pathology, including for prevention, uh, diagnosis, uh, treatment, and also personalized uh, medicine. So as one example, um, I'm going to show uh, some work, uh, some earlier work that we did on the role of the circadian system in cardiovascular control. Um, just to point out that there are a number of uh, factors uh, or disease states that show very clear day-night uh, rhythms, uh, such as uh, the morning peak in heart attacks, asthma symptoms that are uh, dramatically worse uh, during the night, even in patients with asthma who don't have classical nocturnal asthma, and temporal lobe epilepsy that peaks in the afternoon. Now, the, the fact that these rhythms are showing a day-night rhythm does not mean that they're circadian because it could well be that it's actually the transition from sleep to wake, for example, that drives the uh, increased risk in heart, heart attacks in the morning, or the fact that sleep actually is the factor that drives asthma. But we wanted to know what is the actual role, uh, independent of behaviors, uh, but by the circadian system. And so just to focus on the morning peak and heart attack, so we address two questions. One is the circadian system influencing cardiovascular risk factors. And secondly, is there a interaction with behavioral triggers? With other words, does it differ? Does it matter whether you exercise in the morning, in the biological morning or the biological evening? Uh, so this uh, famous graph by uh, Jim Muller and colleagues, which many of you uh, probably know well, uh, shows this broad peak between about 6 a.m. and noon uh, for my myocardial infarction. Many labs have been focused on changes in body posture as possible triggers or uh, changes in physical activity or transitions between sleep and wake uh, as potential uh, triggers uh, for uh, this increased risk in the morning. We wanted to look at the influence of the circadian system, and I won't go through the details, but we uh, uh, applied a circadian protocol called a force synchrony protocol, where we can mathematically tease apart the contribution of the uh, behavioral cycle from the internal uh, circadian cycle by having people live on a, in this case, it was a 20 hour day. So people went to bed um, four hours earlier, and they went around the clock twice so we could mathematically tease apart the circadian regulation of uh, cardiovascular risk factors. One cardiovascular risk factor I want to focus on is 
I1, which stands for plasminogen activator inhibitor one, which is an inhibitor of fibrinolysis. So it inhibits the breakdown of blood clots. With other words, uh, it is a risk factor for thrombo, uh, for thrombosis, for thrombogenesis. And this was uh, worked together with my uh, former mentor and long, long time uh, colleague, Stephen Shea, um, from this circadian protocol where we could actually uh, show that Pi-1 has a beautiful large amplitude and tightly circadianly regulated profile. Um, so that's one. The second thing we observed was that Pi-1 is actually highest at the beginning of a circadian phase here. Zero is the circadian core body temperature minimum, but a circadian phase equivalent in these participants to the beginning of this vulnerable window. So if indeed your blood clots don't get broken down um, much, uh, this may uh, help explain or contribute to the increased risk uh, of uh, blood clotting and thereby uh, myocardial infarction. And it's actually been shown that also in patients with, um, with cardiovascular disease, if you look at day-night rhythms, they show similar rhythms as in healthy participants. So we think these observations in healthy uh, participants here uh, can translate to vulnerable populations. Uh, the other thing just to point out is that Pi-1 happens to be one of those uh, uh, clock control genes that I referred to before. So it makes sense that this is one of these risk factors that is under very tight control of the molecular clock underlying circadian biology. And uh, Martin uh, Young wrote an editorial and he captured the essence very nicely, I think, but with the title, pie at breakfast, whether you like it or not. So because we tease the parts, the effects from the behavioral cycle, we can really assign it to the circadian system such that in this case, even if you stay in the same behavioral state, you will have this beautiful uh, large amplitude rhythm. Now, this was one of the factors we looked at and we, uh, so based on a number of publications since then, which was uh, summarized in a, a recent uh, review by Sarah Shalapa and Nina Hujovic and colleagues, uh, we um, outlined the circadian regulation of cardiovascular risk, risk factors here, where we categorize them according to whether or not they may be contributing uh, or not contributing or maybe intermediate as circadian factors uh, related to the morning, uh, poss possibly causal in uh, contributing to the morning peak in, in uh, heart attacks. And by the way, also strokes, sudden cardiac death and trichler arrhythmias all show a morning peak. So Pi-1 is shown here, very large amplitude uh, rhythm in this risk factor at the early phase. Cortisol had been known for decades. That's nothing new. Pi-1 was new. We also newly showed that uh, platelet activation with flow cytometry was actually under circadian control um, as well. We also, for the first time, showed that plasma epinephrine uh, was under very tight circadian control. And uh, while the peak is not occurring during this vulnerable window, there is a rapid rise in plasma epinephrine. Uh, so which may be contributing as well as the decline in melatonin uh, levels. To our surprise, uh, and in contrast to what you may read in uh, virtually every textbook about blood pressure, um, blood pressure, the circadian contribution of blood pressure is actually not peaking in the morning. So when people use the word circadian often in, in literature, they mean day-night rhythms. But if you look at the endogenous circadian rhythm, it's actually it does show a circadian rhythm, but it's actually showing a, uh, the lowest values during the uh, biological morning. Now, we also looked at, as I said, the interaction with uh, behavioral triggers. So does the circadian phase of the behavioral trigger matter? And so what we found was that when we had people uh, uh, perform every 20 hour standardized exercise uh, tests with the same a number of res resolutions and resistance load, we found that uh, plasma epinephrine uh, increase is largest in the circadian morning and the parasympathetic cardiac modulation assessments show the biggest withdrawal. So it's like pressing on the gas pedal and releasing the brake all at the same time, uh, which may also, uh, in exposure to exercise, may uh, put one at increased risk. 
We also found a number of other, uh, we also looked at, for example, postural uh, cardiovascular challenge and uh, mental stress as well, which have been uh, published. So, um, and this has been summarized, uh, as I said, uh, here's the, uh, the cover picture uh, for the issue um, uh, with uh, another summary of kind of the interaction between behavioral and circadian uh, factors. So next, we uh, were also very interested in the possible contribution of the circadian system to the regulation of glucose uh, tolerance. And this was driven in part by classic work by uh, Afan Kauter, uh, who have, has shown, uh, as is displayed in this figure here that was um, uh, published in, in AGP, that if you give identical test meals at the, in the morning, afternoon, and evening, that you get very different responses of glucose in the circulation. What this means is that in the morning, glucose tolerance is high, meaning the body can cope very well and can uptake the sugar from the circulation and move it into the tissues, whereas in the evening, there's relative impairment of glucose tolerance. Now that has been replicated and is well known. What wasn't known was what is the relative contribution uh, of the, the behavioral cycle uh, versus the circadian system? Is there actually a role for the circadian system in this gradual degradation of glucose tolerance from morning to evening? Uh, because indeed, if you just think about the behavioral and environmental uh, cycle, there can be many factors that can explain this, right? So the morning is preceded by extended sleep, overnight fast, rest, and uh, exposure to darkness, whereas the evening is preceded by typically extended wakefulness, shorter fasting duration, physical activity, and, and light exposure. So it, it's quite... Um, uh, believable that these factors are sufficient and that we don't need a circadian influence. So uh, Chris uh, Morris, um, a former postdoc in the lab, um, looked at this very carefully by using a simulated night work protocol with a particular design that allowed us to pull apart the contribution of the behavioral cycle from the endogenous circadian contribution. So if we look at the effect of the behavioral cycle, comparing meals that were set, that were identical and separated by 12 hours, we can see that the meal at the end of the day that we call dinner, and, and this is the end of the scheduled wake episode, we can see that glucose tolerance is relatively impaired. And so it could be indeed that this effect of the combination uh, of these behavioral and environmental factors uh, helps explain this decline in glucose tolerance from morning to evening. However, when we looked at the endogenous circadian contribution, so taking away, away the factor of um, behavioral cycle, we found that also the circadian system itself influences glucose tolerance. Um, and in fact, the influence is larger than the combined effect of the sleep, wake, feeding, fasting, rest activity, and light dark cycle combined. Also, this is true if you look at the uh, early phase uh, insulin release. So despite a, a similar uh, glucose exposure during the first 30 minutes, you see a massively different uh, uh, amount of insulin in the circulation with uh, greatly suppressed insulin in the circadian evening. And we confirmed this with uh, C-peptide. So what this means is that the endogenous circadian system is an important driver for the impairment of glucose tolerance and pancreatic beta cell function in the evening. What about weight regulation? And this was really, uh, we were really intrigued by observations from animal experimental work. So it had been shown, um, and this is just one of the examples, but it had been shown that in animal experiments, time of food intake matters. This experiment by uh, Diane Arbel and colleagues in Fred Turek's lab had used the wild, widely used uh, diet uh, induced obesity model using a high fat diet. But what they did that was novel was that they assigned these animals to only be able to eat during the inactive phase, so during the light phase when they normally would be mostly sleeping, or during the active phase, during the dark phase. Um, 
And so what they found was that the timing of meals, though 12 hours of uh, food access, had a great effect on the evolution of weight, uh, weight gain. With uh, the level of obesity, uh, much more faster evolution when food access timing was mistimed relative to the normal time. So based on that, we then wanted to look at whether we could find similar evidence in humans that timing of food intake matters. And so the first study that uh, was a collaboration with uh, Marta Garrelet, uh, who's uh, shown here, who's a, a full professor of nutrigenetics in Murcia, uh, Spain. In, um, in her study, we looked at uh, a large population uh, of um, 420 overweight and obese participants, uh, men and women, that were following a 20 week long weight loss intervention. And what we found was that when we did a median split analysis of the timing of their main meal, which in Spain is lunch eaten at about 3 p.m. and consisting of about 40% of the daily caloric intake, we found that timing did matter <clears throat> quite a bit. With late eaters uh, and early eaters differing by about 29% of the success in weight loss. We then subsequently uh, confirmed a similar observation in the six-year follow-up of bariatric surgery, with, which is uh, this more recent paper, where we found that those individuals with, the, with poor weight loss response to bariatric surgery uh, were about twice as likely to be late eaters based on the same uh, analysis. Um, then in the same year as our first paper, a work by the Kubi Reach and uh, in Oren Freud's lab showed that uh, similarly having more of a higher percentage of the calories in breakfast versus in dinner, while the 24 hour caloric intake is the same, showed that the individuals, again, who ate most of their calories early were more successful in weight loss than those who ate most of their calories uh, in, in uh, dinner. Now, uh, Andrew McHill uh, went one step further and asked the question, well, that's interesting that there is a relationship between the clock time at which people eat their food versus the risk for obesity. But since uh, my circadian system may be dramatically different than yours, clock time is not uh, a very precise measure if we think that the driving factor is our biological circadian system. For this purpose, Andrew McHill then uh, conducted the following study in over 100 college students from Harvard in which he looked at the relationship between time of eating relative to the circadian system and uh, adiposity and uh, BMI. How did he do this? Well, he actually used a gold standard for field-based assessments of, um, of circadian phase by looking at the dim light melatonin onset, which is indicated here in these two examples by this dotted line. So normally melatonin starts to rise in the first two hours or so of your habitual bedtime, which is also the case in these two examples. And he then looked in one week where the students were keeping a photo diary, making a picture of every single caloric intake during those two weeks, he looked at the caloric midpoint. So when did these individuals consume 50% of their calories uh, on average, which is this uh, arrow. And he then looked at the relative uh, timing, how early or late did they eat relative to their internal circadian system, finding that uh, as is indicated by these two examples, that there is uh, on average a lower body fat percentage and lower BMI in the early eaters compared to the late eaters. Most interestingly, when he used clock time for the same analysis instead of circadian time, this association fell apart, providing support for the idea that circadian phase of eating uh, may be important. So why would this be? So these prior studies, uh, that those four studies that I've mentioned, they didn't find any differences in caloric intake 
uh, by using diaries. They didn't uh, find any differences in uh, physical activity, although that part has not been studied well. So why could it be that if you eat about the same, that you, there is differential weight loss depending on when you eat? So this, um, uh, we, we have some idea, at least based on one observation, which is that the diet-induced thermogenesis, also known as the thermic effect of food, the magnitude of this is strongly dependent on the circadian phase of eating. So if you eat the same meal in the circadian morning, the amount of increase in energy expenditure is much higher than when you eat the same meal in the evening hours. And so theoretically, at least, this may help explain why eating more of your calories early, where you burn more of those calories, may um, associate with lower uh, body mass uh, gain. So the first paper was uh, published by Chris uh, some years ago now, and Nina Vujovic has uh, more recent uh, work, uh, more careful uh, circadian experiment to confirm this, and this manuscript is in preparation and confirms the uh, basic uh, findings that uh, Chris made. Now, it's not only that the response of the body to food intake at different circadian times or different times of day matters. It's also that the circadian system actually influences when we choose to eat. So uh, some years ago now, we, um, we had shown that, again, using this forces synchrony protocol, the circadian protocol, that hunger and appetite measures are under circadian control, showing that actually your hunger and appetite is highest um, translated to about 8 p.m. or so, and actually lowest values in the morning hours around the time of normal awakening, which may help explain why often uh, breakfast is a relatively small meal or some people even uh, want to skip it. Uh, and then more recently, uh, Jingyi uh, Qian, who uh, is now an instructor uh, in my group, uh, has also shown that this uh, associates with higher levels of acylated uh, uh, ghrelin in the circadian evening, which may help explain uh, the, in part the rhythms in hunger and appetite. So one question I recently uh, got about uh, the feasibility of doing a dim light melatonin onset protocol, which actually requires at least six hours of uh, recurrent sampling of either plasma or saliva under dim light conditions is very challenging to, uh, to perform. So a question I had is, are there any proxy measures that one could use for field-based data to get closer to a circadian measure than just using clock time? And this was actually the basis of the analysis that uh, Xiang Xiao uh, performed here. She is an assistant professor in, uh, at the University of Texas. Um, and so what she used was actually to, you, to look at the relative time of the individual habitual sleep-wake schedule. And also to take into account that we are all, we, we all have different chronotypes. So we all have different preferences of our uh, habitual uh, sleep uh, timing. And so what uh, Xiang Xiao did is she uh, looked at data from um, almost a thousand uh, participants who over one year uh, episode, they collected uh, multiple 24 uh, hour uh, dietary recalls, which actually uniquely included uh, time information that typically is not uh, collected. And so what she found was after looking, using uh, uh, quantiles to look at how much of the 24 hour, uh, percentage of the 24 hour calories are consumed in the first two hours after awakening or the last two hours uh, before bedtime as measures of ear extreme early and extreme late uh, eating. And what she found was that the odds ratio of having uh, obesity or uh, overweight um, was substantially decreased when people ate, were in the highest uh, quantile compared to the lowest uh, quantile for uh, eating uh, in the morning. So with other words, more calories in the morning is associated with lower odds for obesity and, uh, and overweight and vice versa about a doubling of that uh, odds uh, when eating 
in the highest quantiles in the last two hours before habitual bedtime. When she then looked at chronotype, she found that this was more extreme for the morning observation, more extreme in the, uh, in the early uh, chronotype individuals. So dropping down to uh, about a third uh, of the odds and almost fivefold higher uh, odds when uh, in the late chronotype um, when eating close to bedtime. Now, uh, she also found that these associations were stronger for carbohydrates and protein than for fat intake. And I think, again, uh, interestingly, those associations broke down when she used clock time instead of uh, these individuals' personal uh, sleep-wake cycle. So I, again, giving uh, some support to this idea that um, it, it is something biologically driven and not just arbitrarily dependent on uh, a clock on the wall. Now, this paper is in press, and I hope this will uh, come out in the uh, next few weeks, in which uh, Teresa Hernandez, uh, she is actually now uh, completing her, her uh, thesis uh, with uh, Marta Garolet, executed this study to, um, uh, to do a randomized crossover trial with three different uh, conditions, each two weeks long, and each with one week uh, uh, washout in between to look at the influence, not just of timing of food intake, uh, but to look at something that may be more easily manipulated, which is, which is a food element, in this case, um, uh, chocolate intake. And uh, as you can see here, and Marta made this beautiful uh, graphic summary. Uh, so for those individuals who ate their chocolate uh, for those two weeks uh, in the morning, they had a decrease of ad lib uh, caloric intake. So um, they, they partially compensated uh, for the increased caloric intake from uh, chocolate, a decrease in waist circumference, decrease in fasting glucose, increased lipid oxidation, uh, increased siesta frequency, and changes in uh, micro microbiota uh, from stool. Uh, for the evening chocolate eaters, uh, not as large of a decrease in ad lib uh, intake, but an increase in physical activity, heat dissipation, carbohydrate oxidation, sleep regularity, and uh, changes, although not as strong as for the morning group in uh, microbiota. Uh, so I think this is uh, exciting to think about not just uh, what we eat, not just when we eat, but also when we eat what. And so this is uh, going to be uh, uh, part of uh, our future uh, goals to look at this in more detail. So let's now move to circadian misalignment, uh, which is really the mistiming of our behaviors relative to our internal body clock. Um, and of course, this is something that happens chronically in night workers. Um, and so in night workers, uh, might it be that circadian misalignment contributes to some of the uh, adverse health effects? Uh, and indeed, this perspective, this focus on the importance of mistiming has been highlighted by the Nobel Prize uh, Committee uh, back in 2017. Uh, so these are two quotes. So the first quote is that our well-being is affected when there is a temporary mismatch between our external environment and our internal biological clock. And transient is, of course, you can think about uh, jet lag as a, as a good example but also chronic misalignment, uh, which in this case uh, uh, refers to disease. So these two uh, are really uh, important uh, questions. And they're important, uh, as I said, because there is increased risk in uh, night workers um, for a whole variety of disease, including obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer. We also just uh, this year uh, provided evidence for an increased risk in, uh, in asthma. Um, and this is important because uh, about 10% of the workforce, uh, or about 14% actually are the updated numbers of the workforce engages really in night work, either permanent or rotating. And the number is easily 25% or so if you look at other types of shift work, not necessarily purely night work. So in the epidemiological work, the 
question has been, well, how can this be explained? And these factors remain even when correcting or adjusting, I should say, for socioeconomic status, lifestyle, or workload. So what might the course uh, be? And so this was actually um, uh, based on the same work uh, by, by Chris, um, showing uh, a number of outcome measures here, and I'll just go by them. So simulated night work under highly controlled laboratory conditions where people didn't experience differences in, um, in, in workload or so, it was all within subject comparison, randomized uh, crossover design. Uh, Chris found impairment of glucose tolerance um, and in collaboration with Patrick Schauer and colleagues in Maastricht, we found that this is actually primarily due to decreased muscle insulin uh, sensitivity. Uh, Chris also found increases in inflammatory markers, including high sensitive CRP and IL-6, and also increases in blood pressure, as well as decreases in blood pressure dipping that normally occur during scheduled sleep, which has been shown to be an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Now, when we published this work, uh, one of the main comments we got back, well, this is in non-shift workers. What about chronic shift workers? Because maybe chronic shift workers are not negatively impacted, either because they are selected to be able to cope or they have somehow adapted to cope with this. Well, unfortunately, the answer is no. Uh, they don't adapt to this and they haven't been uh, self-selected to fully cope with this because even uh, those chronic shift workers, if we bring them into the lab on a very similar con experimental conditions, they show impairment of glucose tolerance, elevation of blood pressure, and as you can see illustrated here, increases of CRP and loss of uh, its rhythm. Now the other question we got, well, is this, is this mediated through sleep or other, other factors? So we measured sleep in those studies, of course, and with polysomnic uh, somnography, and we show that this is not explained by sleep. So statistically, if we include these as covariates, including sleep stages, these are not explaining uh, our observations either, suggesting there are other factors. And as I've shown uh, before, uh, there is evidence that mistiming of food intake itself may be one of those factors. And um, this is something uh, I'll circle back to at the very end. Um, and this work on uh, a lot of this work on on the role of the circadian system and circadian misalignment on glucose control has recently been uh, uh, reviewed by Ivy Mason and colleagues. And, we, and here it is, is uh, the cover picture that um, Ivy made uh, for the uh, issue. Um, and summarizing uh, the different ways in which uh, circadian phase, circadian misalignment, and sleep can modulate glucose regulation. So there's evidence for the effect on beta cell function of circadian phase, as well as uh, three weeks of circadian misalignment combined with sleep restriction. Impaired insulin sensitivity, evidence for circadian misalignment, also sleep restriction, and um, also the behavioral uh, or environmental evening and combined evidence for impairment of glucose tolerance from all of these factors. So we really need to think carefully about also in, in other studies that don't have a focus on this, whether we're um, in our protocols uh, uh, to whether we're assessing um, at the same uh, circadian phase for different individuals and whether we're inducing circadian misalignment or sleep restriction in those protocols. And the last part I want to talk about uh, melatonin and uh, personalized uh, medicine, at least the first step towards, uh, towards this. Um, so this uh, all started uh, in, in 2009 when I first met uh, Richa Saxena, who is a geneticist at MGH. Um, who with uh, colleagues had published in a number of uh, papers in the same issue of Nature Genetics in 2009, evidence for a novel type two diabetes risk uh, variant in, the in one of the two high affinity melatonin gene, uh, uh, one of the two high uh, affinity melatonin receptor genes. 
In this case, it was MT2, also known as uh, MEL1B. So this gene called MTNR1B itself um, has a common variant that is so common that about half of the whole um, uh, population is a carrier, either homozygous or uh, heterozygous. So it's, it's a very uh, important um, variant thereby, just both because of its large effect and its uh, high uh, prevalence. Now, in these uh, studies in nature genetics in 2090s were based on GWAS so or genome-wide association studies. The glycemic assessments were all done during the daytime. Now, during the daytime, there is no melatonin to speak of because melatonin is the hormone of darkness. And so we were interested that if you may observe effects, even when you're doing uh, assessments, when there is no ligand for the receptor you're trying to test, what about we introduce the ligand melatonin and look at the effects? And this is what we did um, here. And this is uh, in collaboration with uh, Marta Garrelet. We found that melatonin uh, in pharmacological doses in humans, both in the morning and the evening, impairs glucose tolerance. And we found, and this was together with Marta Garlet and Richard Saxena, we found that also uh, this heavily interacts with uh, MTNO1B risk SNP in such a way that the uh, effect is only observed in the carriers, not in the non carriers. Then uh, we wanted to also test uh, again with um, Marta and Richa whether not just pharmacological concentrations, but also physiological concentrations are of importance for glucose control. And the approach there was to give a dinner, an identical evening test meal, either one hour or four hours before habitual bedtime. So with other words, either when endogenous circulating melatonins were, melatonin levels were elevated close to bedtime or were still very low four hours before bedtime. And indeed, what we found again consistently was that um, if we look here at the carriers, we can see a, a, a dramatic impairment of glucose tolerance when the meal is moved by just three hours later. But, and we think that this is due to melatonin because in the non carriers, we don't see that effect uh, at all. Uh, so, in summary, the circadian system uh, is a multi oscillator system generating intrinsic 24 hour rhythms even in the absence of external time cues. The circadian system, as well as the misalignment with the behavioral and environmental cycle, has robust uh, influence on metabolic, inflammatory, and cardiovascular parameters. Late circadian eating uh, impairs glucose tolerance, pancreatic beta cell function, uh, associates with higher adiposity and uh, BMI, associates and, and uh, causes impaired weight loss and um, is associated or causes a lower diet induced uh, thermogenesis. So impaired weight loss has been shown by a, a, a experimental study uh, as well. So some of these are association, uh, but uh, impaired glucose tolerance, better cell function and lower diet induced thermogenesis and impaired weight loss are experimental as well. And as I showed uh, increased hunger in the biological evening. Melatonin, both pharmacological and physiological, impair glucose tolerance, especially uh, in carriers uh, of the MT MTNR1B risk uh, variant. So one of the common themes here, and I know there are others as well, but one of the more recent common themes is really the importance of not just what we eat, but also when we eat. And indeed, uh, our future direction of studies are uh, focused on this. Uh, as well, uh, including, and this is a paper that we, we just sent the revisions back uh, this week, that uh, development of countermeasures against adverse effects of circadian misalignment uh, in simulated shift work uh, using meal timing. Uh, and this was from a randomized uh, control trial uh, uh, by uh, Sarah Shalapa. Uh, Nina Vujovic is, uh, uh, has a manuscript uh, in preparation of looking at the effect of meal timing on energy balance, looking at intake expenditure and also uh, um, gene expression levels in uh, subcutaneous uh, fat samples from humans. The um, uh, effect of interaction between 
MTNO1B genotype and glucose uh, tolerance in a large scale field based study uh, by uh, Marta and Richa. And then uh, Jing Yi is uh, completing a study now looking at uh, this in highly controlled in laboratory conditions, dialing up and down uh, melatonin and looking at glucose tolerance and insulin sensitivity. And then um, I'm just showing their picture because they, the, their picture hasn't been shown yet, but together with Ivy Mason and colleagues looking at the role of meal timing in uh, the success rate of vertical sleeve gastrectomy. So with that, I would like to thank uh, all the collaborators, my colleagues, the funding agencies, and you for your attention. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Frank, that was so great. Um, and we were finished on time, just uh, inspired by the uh, theme of your talk. Uh, we're trying to be on time. So I, I'm going to start. I'm hoping that folks um, will enter questions in the Q&A. I know it's, um, it's, it's less familiar than we're used to, but please, I encourage you to submit questions. Um, this, is, this is sort of a simple question, but um, I, I wanted to get your input on chronotype and the concept that, there, that we, we believe that we, it, is, it sounds like that just like phenotypes, there are different chronotypes and it's normal and there's a spectrum, or perhaps there are categories of chronotypes. My question for you is, how do, you, how do we um, know when a chronotype, how would you categorize a chronotype as being actually abnormal? When does it slip into misalignment? Is it, is it something that you should be, uh, as a child, have a chronotype developed, and then if it is altered in some way, then, then it then becomes abnormal, even if it could fit into someone else's normal chronotype that they've had their whole life. Yeah, that's a great question, Maria. I, I could give an hour long talk <laughs> about that because it's multi-layered onion, so to speak. But so just to um, talk about a few aspects here. So one of the aspects that is most fundamentally core uh, property that is uh, influencing this is circadian period. Circadian period is the cycle length of the clock or the biological clock. And so in the laboratory, using these forces synchrony protocols, we can actually identify each individual's circadian period or cycle length um, and, and show that indeed there is about uh, in healthy, unmedicated individuals, there's about a range of one hour. So the average human period is about 24.15. It's, it's uh, six minutes shorter in, in women uh, than in men. Mm. Um, but it varies by plus and minus half an hour. So that's one aspect. And those people with a longer period are more likely to be evening types and vice versa. The second factor, a biological factor driving chronotype is homeostatic sleep regulation. So some people have a slower buildup of homeostatic sleep pressure such that in the evening they will feel less tired and it will take them longer to build up that sleep pressure. And likewise, they may have a slower dissipation of homeostatic sleep pressure during their sleep, such that they tend to sleep in longer. Mm. And so you can imagine that if you are slower in both, you, you move your whole sleep-wake cycle later and later, even if you have the same period of your clock. Um, then other factors that are less clear are how do people respond differently to phase advancing and phase delaying effects of light? So light in the evening delays your clock, so moves it later, and light in the morning moves it earlier. And some people may be more sensitive in the evening such that they are more likely to be pushed later just by being exposed to light. So those are kind of the three low hanging fruit for biology. And then there is also a lot of environmental and behavioral factors at play. So some people, even if they have the same biology from a circadian and sleep point of view, they may expose themselves to light at night. And so they may, unbeknownst to them, push themselves to be later just by the mere fact that they're exposing themselves to light in the evening and vice versa. Some people may jump out of bed and go for a jog in sunlight and by that nature, uh, push themselves earlier. So those are kind of the, the four main categories. 
which relates to your question in the sense that um, to what degree is this plastic, right? So to what degree can you change? Normally plastic, right? Right. And so we've actually looked at that. So we've looked at the first question about, about plasticity of the human circadian period. And so we've shown that if you expose people to a Martian day for two weeks, so we had people in the lab live on a simulated Mars day, uh, which is slightly longer, we could actually make their internal free running period afterwards longer. So there is some level of flexibility in that system uh, as well. That's, that's really, it's fascinating because I know as we assess patients, being a diabetologist, we assess sleep um, health quite frequently. And I think the variability in um, chronotypes actually is important for us to understand and, and know what's identify what's abnormal. Usually it's pretty obvious. We do have a great question um, about uh, regular exercise in the evening. You, you did, there have been some studies, I saw the chocolate study, observed regular exercise as a behavioral response to timing of chocolate. But what if somebody does, time their exercise in the evening specifically, does that impact um, the, the dietary responses is what the questioner is asking, but I'm, I'm assuming sort of the, the increased sensitivity or glucose tolerance in the morning um, and late and then, you know, impaired at, at the evening. Does exercise make an impact? Yeah. Um, well, maybe I can also peel that apart. So uh, first of all, I think interesting to know is that exercise can actually serve as a side gaber itself. So it can serve as a time cue to muscle clocks or clocks inside the muscle to actually entrain their rhythmicity. Um, and by doing so, uh, also influence their physiology and their response. And um, it's, it's probably, I mean, there's also evidence that other factors such as uh, possibly pulmonary system, et cetera, can be influenced by the timing of exercise. Um, then the other question is, does exercise correlate with uh, different, uh, different risk for metabolic uh, disease, for example? Right. And um, so Jing Yi recently in uh, uh, Diabetes Care has published a paper uh, showing that, and this is based on... Um, the uh, look ahead study, which is showing that men, but not women, show differential response to uh, having their uh, moderate and vigorous exercise bouts in the um, later, uh, sorry, in the morning hours are associated with uh, higher risk scores based on the Framingham index. And so you know, in one, in one way one can think about, well, maybe this is related to the evidence I showed that circadian morning exercise results in more dramatic increases in cardiovascular risk factors. That could be one thing. Of course, that look ahead study is, a, is an observational study. We don't know causality. So might it be that men who are for some other reason at increased risk choose to exercise more in the morning? Uh, and so I think this is really an open question at the moment. There's really a lot to be done. I think the focus is now on meal timing. I think the next big thing will be exercise timing. And Jingyi is actually going to take the lead on, on that question. Um, the other question about exercise before, say, a meal is interesting by itself, because when you exercise just from a simplistic point of view, you will increase the uptake uh, of glucose into the tissues. And so, uh, yeah, that, I think that is um, maybe a, 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 an easier question that yes, that can help decrease um, your glucose load and subsequently. Right, that, that, that's a good point because we do use, utilize that physiology in, in a lot of patients, especially pregnant women, it turns out. But uh, so Rajay, you had a question for Dr. Shear. Yes, I do. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Actually, I have a question regarding to the intermittent fasting, which is uh, the restriction of food intake during a specific time window, right? And so usually I think people can be much more flexible with the time window they choose. So my question, and we all know all the benefits of intermittent fasting. 
So my question is, in regarding to weight loss, does it matter when the window or what is the chosen window of the intermittent fasting? If it's, um, I think during the night, it's not, it's not good. Uh, I think it should be restricted today, according to what I have read before. But do you think a specific time window may be better for weight loss than another? Yeah, so uh, thanks, uh, Rajay. So that the, the field of intermittent fasting is a field that's mixed by a lot of complexities in the sense that one big player uh, that has been shown to be important is fasting duration. So just separate, you know, let's forget about timing. So just fasting duration. Um, we, we have been actually focusing primarily on the other big player, which is timing. And so, you know, as, as I've shown, we have some evidence uh, as well as many other labs evidence that meal timing matters and we think it's causal. So there are some experimental studies that show both a uh, physiological mechanism as well as outcome that, that provide evidence for causality. But then the intermittent fasting literature is complicated by the fact that there are variations in variability of timing. Uh, as you pointed out, not just you know, between people, but also within people. So think about you know, even the 5-2 diet where mm -hmm. uh, you know, another layer, which is sometimes you can have a day off or a day of two off or so. So I think the intermittent fasting literature is really, it's time to really chop this apart into the underlying mechanistic players. And so um, uh, Hassan Dashti is actually writing a review together with Marta Garalet and, ma and myself to really look at this from a, a chrono nutrition, medical chrono nutrition point of view, and really trying to uh, for ourselves, it's more for ourselves than for anybody else, probably, but to create some order <laughs> into this fast literature where it seems everybody has their favorite approach to, to doing it. <laughs> well said. I, I think that it's so true. That's a difficult um, feel to, and everybody says, means something else when they, oh. different when they talk about it. We have a question from uh, Trey Toombs. Um, does the cycling of glucose tolerance levels during the day in a circadian fashion, does that suggest we're meant to eat only once a day? Interesting. Uh, interesting question, yeah. Um, well, meant to is always a hard, hard question to ask, right? But, um, and also I should acknowledge that, um, for example, our temporal resolution is not very high. So, you know, I often get the question, okay, when exactly should I be eating? You know, should I be eating at, at uh, you know, 8.30 or, well, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but this is also that I think there, there may be, even if we know central circadian phase, we don't necessarily know peripheral circadian phase, meaning we may not know the clock timing of the liver and of the pancreas and the adipose tissue, et cetera. So I think um, that's kind of one uh, note. I think that even if the circadian system would generate something that looks nicer, looks like a nice smooth cosine, it doesn't that you can't deal with product meals, which is what we eat. And so um, I think it just indicates that there are particular circadian phases at which find to uh, quickly deal with those uh, carbohydrate loads. Um, the other the other aspect is that there is also such a thing as a second meal effect. So you know it gets quickly, and, and many of you will notice. So if you eat a pre followed shortly after by a second meal, your glucose tolerance is going to be much better. So actually, that dynamic of meal to meal interaction is another big factor that is uh, in need of of careful study. Great. Well, let me um, take this opportunity to thank you, Frank, because this, I think I learned a lot and I know that our audience did, we're all already getting excellent feedback. So thank you for contributing to our knowledge today. Thank you. And I'm happy if anybody has, uh, if I haven't addressed your question, you want to pop me an email, happy to uh, respond. That thank is you. wonderful. Thanks, Frank.
That was wonderful by Dr. Shear. We are so grateful. And we are now going to transition because it is late and it's Friday uh, to our award ceremony. Um, and thanks to everyone who uh, have been patient. So uh, first of all, let me, before we post the winners, um, I just want to explain how we do this. Um, we generally, uh, what we will, what we do is we award the short talk speakers, um, Rajay Tal Talbi, Selma Boulenoir, and Danielle Haslam. Uh, they each get $500. They were selected because their abstracts uh, went to the top of our, our list as far as um, innovation and scientific integrity and uh, we we were impressed by them. So congratulations to the three of you. You did a wonderful job with your talks. Um, the top poster awards uh, go to the following people. Uh, James Luo. James uh, presented on sleeve gastrectomy, promotes colitis associated cancer via modified microbiome. He is from Eric Shoes Lab. Congratulations to you, James. And uh, James will receive $250 as uh, an award to him and, and his work. The second awardee is Claire McIntyre. Claire McIntyre is, um, she's presented lipid metabolism fuels, IL-17 positive uh, T cells in obesity and the tumor microenvironment. She is from the Lydia Lynch lab uh, and we congratulate her. Thank you, Claire. And last but not least, we have um, our last awardee is Dinah Four. Dinah presented on glucagon-like peptide one receptor agonist decrease uh, plus platelet-mediated airway inflammation. She's an instructor and she is uh, it, beginning her independent career and we're very uh, proud of her. We're proud of all of you. Uh, you did a great job. Uh, really super impressed this year by all of the posters. Uh, they're always um, very high quality and it's extremely difficult for us to choose. Um, we we uh, had a limit of three this year and uh, we would have given more if we could. So congratulations to you guys. Um, you'll be receiving your, your funds shortly. Uh, other thanks um, I want to say to the attendees today. Many of you, you were here the whole time. We were so um, uh, uh, grateful for that. Uh, we want to thank Dr. Shear for his excellent keynote speaker. Uh, and of course the poster speak, speech, I should say, or talk. Uh, the poster presenters and short talks were outstanding. All of our judges for taking the time to participate in this process. We thank you and we look forward to seeing you all next year. Thanks everybody. <laughs>